Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for our Candid Coffee Conversations today. I'm very excited to have Dr. Malizia here with us. She is going to be talking about something that is super important, especially as breast cancer diagnosis um, are occurring and they're recurring with women who are younger um, or women who have not had children yet and some men who have not had children yet. And so really, really cool to have her here as an expert to kind of guide us through some burning questions that we have Um Dr. Malizia, please go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone. Okay. Hi. Thank you, everybody, for having me um, and for the introduction. I'm Dr. Malizia um, Beth. I practice at Alabama Fertility um, here in Birmingham, and I am a native of New Jersey, so not a not a longtime Southerner, although I've been in the South for many years. So I, grew, I say that I grew up defending living in New Jersey, and now I defend living in Alabama <laughs> um, to my friends and family. I uh, did undergraduate uh, at Cornell in upstate New York. I worked in New York City for a little while before deciding in finance, before deciding to go back to medical school. I uh, did medical school at UNC in Chapel Hill, which I thought North Carolina was the South until I moved to Birmingham for residency. <laughs> and then I realized this is the real South um, for sure. Did UAB OBGYN residency for four years here. And then my husband and I moved to um, Boston. Um, I did a fertility fellowship at uh, Harvard and Boston IVF, and then found a job back in Birmingham. Um, I've been here since about 2008. I was the second physician to join Alabama Fertility originally at that time. Uh, the practice has grown pretty substantially, and we've moved locations. We now have five physicians. We have a large state-of-the-art facility over on 31, um, the big white building on the hill, and we have some satellite offices in Montgomery and Huntsville. So we try to really spread ourselves to serve as many patients in the in the, not just the Birmingham area, but in, in all of Alabama as much as we can. Well, thank you so much for defending the South. Like, I'm yeah. like... <laughs> Right. right. You know, Birmingham is one of those gems that people don't realize exist. Yes. You know? So thank you for sticking with yes. us. My family wonders why I live here until they visit. And then they realize, yes, that it's a lovely, it's lovely place. It's beautiful. And the food is so good. It's yeah, so good. <laughs> that's right. You're not here to eat with this that you won't want that's right. <laughs> So um, jumping right into it. What, um, what are some of the impacts of a breast cancer diagnosis and a, bleh, I'm jumbling my words, a breast cancer diagnosis and the treatment. Um, what is the impact that it can have on someone um, who has some concerns about fertility? Does the treatment impact um, a person's fertility and such and things like that? Yeah. So any cancer diagnosis is difficult, um, and I think breast cancer is specific, specifically important in our population, since as you mentioned, many of those patients are young. Um, some of them may have started their family but desire a larger family or may not have started a family at all and desire future fertility. So that presents sort of a, a, a different case than patients who are presenting with cancer diagnoses later in life once their reproductive function and their reproductive life is finished. Um, chemotherapy is probably the thing we think about the most in terms of its effect on future fertility. We talk about ovarian reserve, and I'll bring that term up several times in this conversation today. What that term means is the way that the brain and the ovary are communicating. It's how uh, the, the reserve is within the ovaries. We are born with all the eggs we will ever have. Um, men are kind of constantly making sperm. Women are born with all the eggs we'll ever have. It feels slightly unfair, but that's the way it is. And there's a slow decline in our ovarian function just as we age from from birth and very few things will affect that. Um, even pregnancy or breastfeeding or birth control pills or anything that, that women do in terms of regular cycles or not, there's still that just very slow decline in, in our ovarian function as we age. So we use this term ovarian reserve to kind of try to put some numbers on where we stand on that. Mm -hmm. So when a patient presents, we talk to them about their age, and their ovarian reserve. And most of the time, those things go hand in hand and we'll sort of say, okay, here's the path that we expect. Here's where we expect you to be. And your testing confirms that. So chemotherapy can sort of advance women down that spectrum of ovarian reserve. And it's important where the patient is prior to their treatment to sort of 
you know, have some ability to see where that may go after treatment. The patient's age is very important as well. And then obviously in other types of cancers where treatment may involve radiation to the pelvis, that can also affect the uterus and ovaries in, in other ways. But the main thing we think about with um, breast cancer diagnosis is the chemotherapy. Um, you, so you kind of answered one of my questions that I'm going to come back to later, but That's okay. Um, one follow-up question that I have to that, I, I like that you brought up the this particular um, types of treatment and how they can impact um, specifically like a woman's, um, you said ovarian reserve. So what about those treatments um, cause, you know, those things to change and, you know, what makes age um, a big factor in that? Sure. So, I, you know, unfortunately we all know age impacts everything. Um and age will not only impact sort of the, the treatment, but it also impacts where that patient may be in their life. So whether they're single, whether they have a partner, whether they're married, whether they have kids currently, whether they plan to have children, what their future plan is for family size, um, all of those things can sort of, you know, present differently depending on the patient. Um, those things will then impact the options that somebody has. Um, for example, um, egg banking versus embryo banking. So these are the, the main things we'll talk about a little bit today, but these will be the main things that a physician would talk to a cancer patient about is, do we want to bank up eggs? Meaning we're just dealing with the patient and their own genetic material and putting that into the storage facility for future use. Or does that patient have a spouse or partner that they have will have long-term and want to bank embryos for their future use. So there's pros and cons to both of those things. Every patient's different. Every patient's situation is different. So certainly the age that they present will then impact a lot of these other conversations that we have. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so when should someone start thinking about this after they've, they've been diagnosed? Um, for example, if you have someone who is young or someone who's just middle-aged and married and hadn't started their family yet, um, yeah. when should they start having these types of conversations and making these types of plans um, for a future family? Yeah, really, as soon as, as soon as the cancer diagnosis is given and, and really, in fact, we occasionally will see patients or get phone calls even prior to that time, women who have had a mammogram that's abnormal, women who are about to have a biopsy that they're concerned about, um, even awaiting pathology results for something. And they start to think, gosh, I haven't thought about this. I've been young and healthy and living my life. And now all of a sudden I'm faced with this possible cancer diagnosis and I really want to address this. So the first step, I mean, just call us, um, you know, Alabama Fertility. Again, we're in a couple of different locations. You, when you call, you know, please indicate that you're a cancer patient. Um, that will put you at the top of the list to get in for a visit. We make special accommodations for patients who have cancer diagnoses. Sometimes our first visit may be two, three, and four weeks out with some of our physicians. We'll want to make sure that someone who's anticipating or has a cancer diagnosis is getting in as soon as possible so that we can begin to have these conversations early and, and have some time to think through this a little bit. So even for somebody who comes in and sees us and says, I'm really not sure I want to go through any of that type of treatment. I'm not really sure what I want to do. We're certainly happy to see anyone and talk to them about what the options are, what they have, where we think they stand, how we think their um, treatment may affect their future options and plans. I mean, most important is the patient's health. So we certainly want to think through, you know, the, that, that aspect of this number one, and then also think through what those future options that patient may have. Breast cancer is very treatable. So we have a lot of patients who have been through, you know, this from, from both sides as, as you guys know, firsthand. Mm -hmm. Um, so is there a point where, so say someone's died and, and, and when someone's diagnosed, so many different things can be going on in their head. Right. And, they, and, that, and even though that's a big thing that they want in their life, maybe they're not thinking about that at that moment. And, you know, maybe they go ahead and they start treatments and all these other different yeah. things. And then they think about, Oh, like, right. what about this? I didn't need to think about that, but now here I am in the middle of treatment. So my question is, is there a time where, 
is there ever a moment where it's just like, goodness, like, is this too late to start this process or anything like that? Like, are there any stipulations on time and where you are in treatment? Yeah. Um, so ideally we're, you know, in the ideal world, we're getting these diagnoses, we're having time to see patients and treat and, and, and maybe get some eggs out or do some things prior to their treatment. That is a specific situation that doesn't happen for many patients. There are times where they need to begin treatment immediately, and we don't want to delay that. We want them to get the treatment that they need. Um, I have lots of patients who come in to see us after treatment. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they went through treatment at a younger age, and now they're you know married or have a, a long-term partner, and they're ready to grow their family, and they want to know how this affects their ovarian reserve. Where do they stand? What are their treatment options? Um, so we are always happy to see patients sort of at any time along their treatment when they have questions or concerns and we can talk through, you know, what those may be. There are some, you know, specific treatments. There's a medication called Lupron, which will sort of down regulate, sort of suppress the ovarian function during treatment. Um, a lot of breast cancer physicians and, and, and other physicians in the oncology world, you know, are now beginning to use that type of medicine. It's not perfect. Um, it's not a magic wand. It does not completely protect the ovaries um, from the effects of the chemotherapy. But there are things like that that can be talked about really at any point along someone's treatment path. And then certainly if someone's had a cancer diagnosis and treatment is now healthy and ready to start a family you know, that's a great time to come in to evaluate things as well. Thank you so much. Um, so what does, and, and I know this is very subjective, it's very individualized to a person's treatment and where their body is and where their age is, um, but are you able to kind of tell us a little bit about like a time frame? Like, what does all of this look like as far as like, I have called and I'm ready to start this process. What does that look and feel like? So patients will present, will want to know, you know, what type of cancer they have, especially for breast cancer, their receptor status, what's their treatment plan, what's the timing of that plan. You know, ideally, this is a conversation that we also have with their cancer physician and their oncologist and say, you know, hey, is this person a good candidate for this type of treatment? Can I raise this person's estrogen for nine days and that's safe for them? And, you know, those types of conversations about um, what type of treatment they may need. And again, we don't want to delay that or interrupt that. And we certainly don't want to negatively affect their long-term treatment success with anything that we're doing in, in, in our office. Ideally, we have a couple of weeks of time. The, the, the process of actually coming into the office saying, here's the deal, and this is what we want to do, getting that plan can be pretty quick. Um, in order to get eggs out and banked, we need about two weeks. So the, there are medications that are given to women to help to boost their ovarian production of eggs. Every month we go through a natural process where we make one egg at a time. And what these medications do is try to get a group of eggs to grow. So rather than just a group growing and then one sort of becoming the egg for the cycle, which is what happens in a natural cycle, these medications will help that entire group of eggs to grow and develop, okay? And for some women, that group may be two or three or four, and other women, it may be 15 or 20 or 25. So there's a large range in what that can look like. Once the eggs are grown and developed, we monitor that process with some blood work and ultrasound, and then we do an egg retrieval. And an egg retrieval is done within our office, um, and it's a very quick and easy procedure. We use a little bit of IV medications, and you take a little lovely 15-minute nap, um, and then the patient would wake up and head home. So the 9 to 12 days of medicines with a couple of visits for monitoring their ovarian response, and then the egg retrieval. So this is not months and months and months of treatment, um, but it is timed with someone's menstrual cycle, unless they're on birth control pills. So there are sometimes little wiggles that we have to do to get that to fit in and make sense for the patient. So ideally, you know, we can really get that rolling and, and timed well. Many of the patients that we see in this type of situation, we call up their oncologist and their oncologist says, that's great. That works nicely. We're planning our first chemotherapy at this point in time, and we're just kind of getting everything lined up prior to that. Um, so that's ideal. Um, it doesn't always happen that way, and that's okay too. 
So if a patient goes through treatment and is, you know, healthy and ready to grow their family, then we would come back in and talk through options at that point as well. Okay. And I like that you pointed that out because I mean, in my mind, I was thinking that it takes a very long time. So it's right. really cool to hear that it's very different than that. Yeah. Um, most people assume that fertility treatment, you know, they think about fertility treatment or if they hear the terms IVF or they hear all these different ways to think through this. And they think, gosh, that's got to be months and months and months of treatment. And when we really sit down and talk through it and I say, Hey, look, I need you to take these medicines for nine to 12 days. They're, they're sort of like, really? That's it. <laughs> you know, this is a shorter time frame that's mimicking what the body's going to do in a natural menstrual cycle as well, which is, you know, grow this egg over the course of those first two weeks and then release the egg. In this case, we're just growing hopefully more than one egg and a group of eggs and then draining the eggs from the ovaries in a simple office procedure rather than letting them release. Awesome. Um, thank goodness for science and for doctors, because I mean, that is amazing, truly. <laughs> um, but um, another question that I have, um, so what are some things that you think would be helpful for individuals to kind of consider um, even before, um, or things that they should know prior to making that call to say, you know, hey, I'm ready to start this journey. What are some things that you think would be helpful for individuals to know um, when they're beginning this journey to sure. grow their family? So first of all, is it, it don't ever hesitate to reach out. Um, I feel very strongly that women are empowered with information and, and patients in general, not just women, but patients are empowered with information. We want to give you as much information about your specific situation as we can. And so, you know, we're all, we're all tempted to start just Googling down the Google machine and getting that kind of going down that path. And sometimes those things are really helpful and other times they, they're they not. So seeing a physician coming in, talking with one of us and getting information about where they stand specifically to them, um, I think is very beneficial. And even if that person says, you know what, that's great. I've got all my information. I don't, I don't feel strongly about pursuing this at this time. That's totally great. But I never want a patient to look back and say, gosh, I really wish I had had this information two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago instead of waiting until now to think through it. So, you know, always give a call. We'll want to know things about the treatment history. We'll want to check ovarian reserve status. Really an evaluation can be a, an office visit, a little bit of blood work and a quick ultrasound. And that can really give us a decent amount of information about what might be available to those, to those patients. That being said, there are always options. So what we're talking about mainly today is women who are younger and have ovarian reserve to have maybe their own fertility with their own eggs in the future. And we're talking about banking up eggs or embryos for the future. I have women who've gone through cancer treatments of any sort who come in and their ovarian reserve is, is not great. They are basically in menopause from that treatment. We still have options. So we have patients that go through donor egg cycles where we use a young, healthy donor, either through our program or a national facility. We have donor embryos that have been donated to our program that patients can choose from in order to grow their family. So there are often many options for patients, even if it's in a, you know, a situation where now we're down the line and now we're thinking about this and their ovarian reserve is not good or they have not done as well. Um, through their treatment. So, you know, those are all sound really outside of the box kind of things. Um, this is what we do every day. So to us, this is, these are normal options that we talk about. And for many women, they, you know, want to, want to grow their family. And um, there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, another question, I guess this will be my final question um, because I mean, ultimately there's the factor of cost, and so um, what resources, because I mean, cancer is an expensive diagnosis. I mean, just you can have the best insurance <laughs> and it still costs just a lot. You never know what your needs will be and your treatment and all those different factors. So what um, what does that look like as far as cost? And if someone is struggling with cost, um, what are some resources that are available in the community that people can kind of talk to others about and, and take advantage of? Yeah. Um, cost, unfortunately, is a huge piece of, of any fertility treatment. Um, 
The state of Alabama doesn't have an insurance mandate for fertility treatment. There are states that do that. Um, unfortunately, Alabama is not one of them yet. We, we, yeah, we're we going to say yet. We're, we're working. Um, <laughs> but that means that this will fall into whatever general medical coverage they may have. Um, in, in cases where someone does not have any medical coverage for this type of treatment, egg banking can cost anywhere between $5,000 and $8,000. Embryo banking is a little bit more expensive because it move, it use, uses more of the laboratory uh, to do that. And that's more like twelve to $15,000. The, the, the range that I'm giving is dependent on what type of protocol we're using. And some of that money is medication costs. The medicines for these cycles can be expensive. Um, there are pharmaceutical programs and pharmaceutical companies that offer um, you know, medications to cancer patients. Our nurses are very adept at filling out those forms and getting things in. They require my signature and an oncologist signature, but a lot of the medication costs um, are pretty easy to get covered. Um, there, the cost of the cycle itself, there occasionally are insurance companies, Blue Cross Blue Shield has a couple of different types of policies, and some of them will cover infertility treatment in a patient with a cancer diagnosis. So we do sometimes see that we can, you know, utilize as much coverage as they may have, and then use the pharmaceutical programs for medications. There are also other online programs, Live Strong has a, a fertility program as part of their, um, you know, their company as well. So depending on where somebody is in this treatment plan and path, you know, certainly try to help them from that perspective in terms of cost. Um, you know, I think you, you know, um, at Forge better than anything that this is stressful, um, that, we, we actually utilize a study that looks at infertility diagnosis and treatment, as well as cancer diagnosis and treatment, and actually relates the, the stress level in those treatments as being relatively similar. And so, you know, I will often say to my fertility patients, hey, this is not nothing. You know, this is, this is a stressful situ situation. Well, you know, patients that are coming to us from Forge, they are dealing with both diagnoses. They, they are dealing with both a cancer diagnosis and the stress of trying to figure out their their fertility and their future fertility. So that piece of this is it, it's there, and we know that, and we recognize that. So as much as you know, we can help to support patients with as much sort of medical side information. I know Forge does a great job with counseling services, and and I love the five quality of life areas you guys have on your on your side, and all the ways that you help to support these patients in that way. So that's a fantastic program and a great piece of the puzzle that kind of has to go hand in hand with the medical side of this. I often will say to patients, the medical piece of this is going to be easy. The psychological and emotional part of this is going to be hard, um, and that's the the part that you know to me as much information and as much reassurance as we can give patients to what their options may be. And even just knowing they have options. Mm -hmm. I saw a patient the other day who had a new breast cancer diagnosis. She came in, she has a child, but wants a second. And we sat down and talked through what this treatment would look like. And they were considering banking embryos. And she called back and she said, you know what? I, I, I'm really anxious about my cancer treatment. I just want to get that started. I just want to focus on that. But just knowing that, I may be able to be pregnant with a donor egg or a donor embryo if this treatment really negatively affects my ovaries. That just made me feel better to know that. And so for a lot of patients, that that in and of itself, just having that knowledge will decrease the stress of what this may look like for them in the future. Thank you so much. Um, some of the key points that I for sure took away is like, A, there's no one size fits all. Um, and that information is power and to just utilize the resources around you to help you through this because it's not it's not going to be something that you can just easily gloss over because it involves so much of you and those who love you. It's going to involve your mind. It's going to involve your body. It's going to involve involve your entire care team. And I love that, you know, you all are able to work with individuals, care teams to be on the same page and to make sure that, you know, whatever that patient A needs, but also the things that they desire can be of the utmost importance. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, 
being yourself. <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, yeah. So I wanted to open the floor for anyone who's on the call. If you all had any other questions um, that you would like to um, ask Dr. Melizia, um, please know that now is a great time to do so. We did such a good job. Nobody has questions. <laughs> I hope that's what that means. Um, <laughs> so are there any other final thoughts that you would like to leave our viewers with? Um, you know, I think that the the process of fertility care is out there. I mean, it's getting more and more um, present. I mean, in the media, you know, people are talking about it more. Um, so these, these stars that are going through fertility treatments are at least saying now, Hey, I got pregnant with IVF. And, you know, that, that piece of that, I think is fantastic. I think women are being, you know, at least presented with more and more information that, you know, fertility is important. It's important to talk through. It's important to think through. And it, it's very reassuring to me to see that happening, you know, all across the board and, and, and training in Boston and then coming to Birmingham, recognizing that, you know, there is a difference culturally in, in, in terms of the way that women think through fertility and, and that if you don't have your family created by the time you're 23, that's okay. Um, and we have options and we have choices. And so I, I love that this is out there. I love that you guys are doing this. I think obviously I feel very strongly that fertility is an important, um, you know, thing to talk about, but there's a balance of not wanting people to be too, you know, it, just discouraged by their fertility or worrying about their fertility so much that that's consuming versus being able to understand that it is an important issue. And if you're 47, we have a different conversation than when you're 37 or 27. And that that's just natural physiology. That's just what, what we are. So it's an important topic. I love that you guys are presenting it. I think it's fantastic. I love that it's out there a little bit more. Um, so I guess my, you know, encouragement would be, you know, please, you know, talk about this and think about this, you know, think about this as a, as a piece of the puzzle, even for women who don't have a cancer diagnosis, you know, just talk to your friends and family about this, get this sort of out there. We're happy to share information, um, you know, really at any time to, for people, especially in their very specific situations. Thank you so much, Dr. Melizia. And I'd snap to all of that, um, you know, just because I feel like there's a little bit of stigma around what fertility can mean for someone um, just in general. And then also to throw a cancer diagnosis of any kind on top of that or whatever their medical situation might be, it, it can be very scary. So to know that they can just call and have conversation and just see what their possible options could be. And they can make plans too, you know, and things can change and it will still be okay. <laughs> yeah, things are going to change. Things are always going to change. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we don't require a referral. We don't require patients to, you know, always have to be seen, you know, right away. They obviously can if, if they have a specific situation, but yeah, I mean, think about it, talk about it, feel free to reach out there. You know, they're pretty good resources that are out there, but nothing beats sort of coming in and, and talking to somebody because everyone is different. Everyone's situation is different. Um, and so whether you're just getting the diagnosis of cancer or you've had it or you're through treatment or you're 10 years through treatment and you want to know what those options are, again, there's, they're, there's nothing wrong with giving a call and, and checking those kinds of things out. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Melizia. It's been so wonderful having you. I could talk about this a long time fertility. <laughs> and something I've, I've never had the opportunity to talk to a doctor about, you know, just what does all of that mean? And what is that process? So I'm just very, very grateful that you spared your time to share this resource. I mean, coffee conversations are things that we share with many people that might be new to Forge and they usually come with a bajillion questions. And so it's always just such a great um, resource to have to send to people and say, hey, go and watch this video. And then they feel like, okay, well, Though those are realistic questions that I have and some questions I haven't thought of um, yeah. in my journey. And so I'm always just very grateful when anybody takes the time out to say, hey, I have a breast cancer diagnosis. Um, I need some information. And to have you all 
um, take the time to sit with us, to have these real conversations about things that people are experiencing and giving them some of those answers and those tips to help navigate this. We are just forever grateful for because we really want to make this process um, as smoothly as we can and make them feel as supported and seen as possible because it's just such a hard time. So yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you later.